This video is designed to be a bit of an introduction to VCE Media Area of Study 3 in Unit 4, Media Influence. So in this video we're going to be looking at a bit of an overview of what's uh, entailed in this unit as well as the scope and sequence. We'll also cover some key definitions and just give you a broad idea as to what to expect from this area of study. So according to the study design, the key knowledge that we need to be walking away from this area of study is the idea of um, communication theories and models and how that can be applied to the media. Theories of audience and the audience's relationship uh, with media text as explained through some of these communication models. We're also going to look at the arguments and the evidence about media influence on audiences and on the broader community. We're also looking at arguments surrounding the rationale for um, and against media regulation, particularly media regulation in Australia. You might remember that we covered a little bit about regulation in year 11. We also need to know some appropriate media language and terminology. As always, terminology needs to be embedded in everything that we do, particularly our SACs and exam. So this unit in a nutshell is the study of the relationship between media and audiences. The big question that we're answering here is, does the media have an influence, positive or negative, on audiences? And the one thing that you need to take away from this video, if you don't take away anything else, is that there is no definitive answer. There is absolutely no correct answer to this question. We do not know the true nature of the relationship between the media and audience. Instead, we have a number of theories that all try to explain if and how the media influences um, the community. None of these theories are 100% accurate. Each of them have flaws, and that's why we have to debate uh, these theories and explain why one theory can apply to a particular example um, and a different theory can apply to uh, a completely different example. So the debate between these theories centres around the idea of the nature and extent of media influence. Now these two terms are really important to um, know the definitions of. So the nature of media influence refers to the kind of influence that the media has on people. So this can be seen in the ways that media influence manifests in society, such as agenda, agenda setting, copycat behaviour, etc. So when we watch um, something in the media, what kind of influence does it have on us? And then when we look at the extent of media influence, this refers to the degree or the level of influence um, that the media has on people. So how much the media influences an audience. Uh, so if there's a copycat behavior, does it influence us to um, just copy a certain thing or do we completely change our look and behavior to match what the media tells us? So the extent refers to just how big an influence the media might have. So when we're analysing um, media influence, we can look at a number of theories or models that have been developed over the course of the last 100 years. Uh, these different communication theories argue what the exact nature and extent of the media's power over an audience is. Now, think about media influence as a spectrum. We have at one end of that spectrum the idea that the media has great power and great influence over audiences. At the other end of that spectrum, we've got the idea that media has no power over audiences, and in some cases it's the audience actually who has power over the media. So think about that line from one end to another and consider where you personally sit on that spectrum. Where do you think the power really lies? Is it somewhere over to the far left where the media has the greatest power and the audience just uh, sucks up everything that they say? 
or is it somewhere towards the right where the audience actually has more power than the media and can dictate what uh, the media presents or are we somewhere in the middle? As you're considering your own position, you should be aware that uh, wherever you sit on that line, somebody's probably come up with a media theory to explain that position. In fact, there have been dozens of theories over the years, each of them trying to explain exactly what the nature of the relationship between media and audience is. All of them have their advantages, all of them have their flaws. Fortunately for us, we do not need to know all of these, but we'll be looking in uh, detail at five of these particular theories. The ones that we're looking at range from uh, the hypodermic needle theory, or the, sometimes called the bullet theory, through to agenda setting function theory, to reinforcement theory, encoding, decoding, and then at the other end of the spectrum, uh, uses and gratifications theory. So we've chosen five here that appear um, relatively equal distance from one another along that spectrum. So it's important to note that with each communications theory, it has its own set of evidence to support it. In each case, the evidence does work to somewhat um, explain and support what that theory contends, but each also has its own set of criticisms and drawbacks. Often these criticisms are linked to either the time and place in which the theory uh, was born, or the evidence and methodology that that particular theory uses. For those of you doing some of the science subjects at VCE or perhaps did science in junior years would understand the idea that methodology can, um, can be a range of different forms and each of those different methodologies have its own advantages and disadvantages. So when we're analysing these theories, we need to point out what the disadvantages were of each of the methodologies that were used. We also need to understand that not just the theory or model that we personally align with, but we need to consider the strengths, weaknesses, the type of evidence, and the context of all of these five theories. And we need to be able to compare and contrast those to apply to different circumstances. So when we're thinking about this spectrum and whether um, a theory lands on the side of the media has little to no power or over on the side that the media has great power, we can look at it in terms of two things. We can look at it in terms of texts and audiences. If we split right down the middle and consider that on the left-hand side the media has great power, Typically then the text for a media that has great power would be what we call closed. On the other side, if the media has little influence, texts are considered to be open. Similarly, when we're thinking about audiences, um, when the media has great power, audiences tend to be passive. And then the more active that audiences become, the more that they empower themselves and therefore take that power, that influence away from the media. These are some key terms that we need to understand and we'll talk through these now. So in terms of closed and open texts, we can think about closed texts as one that leads the audience to make a single interpretation. And typically that interpretation of that media text is the one that the media producer intends the audience to believe. So we can think of an example of this as being a weather report. So if we're watching the news and in the last five minutes, the weather report comes on that says, tomorrow in Melbourne, it will be sunny and 25 degrees. If you spoke to 100 people who saw that news bulletin, each and every one would say that tomorrow the weather would be sunny and 25 degrees. Nobody would turn around and say, actually, uh, I believe that it's going to be snowing and only five, a top of five degrees. We absorb what's in that text and we have only one interpretation of it. And that's what we call a closed text. <laughs> 
Opposite to that is the idea of an open text. Now, an open text allows multiple interpretations or negotiated interpretations by the audience. There is not just one single meaning. So an example of this might be a film that you go and see and um, you see it with your friends and you interpret that film in a completely different way to your friends do. Perhaps it ends on a cliffhanger. Something like Inception does this, where we watch it and some people think, oh, hang on, is he in a dream? And others think, no, 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 the token definitely moved. So we can have different interpretations if the text allows us or invites us to do so. Then when we're looking at theories of audience, and you'll remember that this is one of the key uh, knowledge criteria for us. So theories of audience is whether an audience is passive or active. So we can think about a passive audience as one that merely receives the media's message, accepting it without critical thought or input. We as an audience just sit there and we completely absorb what we see. We don't have an active role in terms of interpreting it. So um, think about this in terms of traditional media tends to have a passive audience. Going to the cinema, you sit there, you shut up, you look at the screen and you absorb what's coming at you. Opposite to this would be an active audience. Now, an active audience is one that is uh, involved in the meaning-making process. An active audience brings to the film their own understanding and knowledge, and an active audience negotiates the media message through critical thought or their own input. So we can see these in uh, more recent media forms, uh, something like um, 360 uh, VR cinema, where we actually uh, take in the message and we have an input on what message that media is producing depending on where we look. Uh, video games is another example of this, where uh, you might have a completely different understanding of the video game depending on the choices that you make and the buttons that you push compared to your friend who might be um, making different choices in that game. The more active that you are, the more that the audience actually uh, changes the meaning that the text or the media product actually produces. And just on audiences, when we're talking about um, media influence, um, we think about, okay, well, the media might not have the same type of influence on everyone all the time, Particularly when it comes to making laws about the media, there is often talk about protecting vulnerable audiences. So these vulnerable audiences are those that are believed to be especially susceptible to the influence of the media. So who exactly is a vulnerable audience? Well, over time, different groups have been identified as vulnerable for a variety of reasons, um, including the elderly, uh, and we can think about this in terms of perhaps we've got grandparents who are on social media and they're more susceptible to scamming um, people who pretend to be someone else and try to get their um, bank details or personal information off them. Because they don't necessarily understand the new media technology, they're more vulnerable to scamming attacks. Um, people with mental illness uh, tend to be seen as a vulnerable audience. A recent example of this might be the warnings that have come out about uh, the Netflix series 13 Reasons Why. Um, the reason why uh, parental groups and schools have had a bit of a reaction to this series is because it depicts suicide and there is a fear that um, it might influence people who already have um, suicidal tendencies or perhaps experience a bit of uh, depression, that they might be influenced by this. Um, the undereducated or people with a low IQ tend to be seen as um, a vulnerable audience. Uh, in this case, it is um, linked to think ideas like propaganda on war or political propaganda where um, people who don't have a very good education are seen as perhaps not being able to critically think about the messages that the media produces for them. 
teenage boys are seen to be vulnerable because they might be led to uh, be more violent by playing violent video games. Teenage girls will seem to be more vulnerable in terms of uh, issues of body image in terms of what they see in the media. And there's even a point where uh, women were seen as being a vulnerable audience um, way back in the early 1960s because of the idea that, well, if women are at home watching television all day, that they might be susceptible to some of the advertising there. Essentially, every group has been seen as a vulnerable audience, except for the group that comprises most of these media theorists which unfortunately do tend to be middle-aged white men. And anyone who sits outside of that group tends to be considered to be a vulnerable audience at one stage in history or the other. But there is one group that media theorists around the world and across time um, and lawmakers and people who are putting the rules in place for regulating the media, there's one group that they identify as being particularly vulnerable and in need of protecting from the big bad media. Of course, we're talking about S-E-X in front of the C-H-I-L-D-R-E-N. Sex cauldron? I thought they closed that place down. Yes, children are seen as being particularly susceptible to the media's message and in need of protection. We can see this in some of the regulations that are put in place about the classifications and what children are and are not allowed to see, particularly in terms of violence and sex or nudity. And so there are some of the key terms and ideas that we will be exploring throughout this area of study. This was, video was a really brief overview. If you want to look at any of these uh, key ideas in a bit more detail, I suggest that you read the pages um, 223 to 227 of the Heinemann Media textbook. That outlines in greater detail exactly what we're looking at in this unit. Subsequent videos in this series will explore some of the theories that we'll be looking at in more detail. So I suggest that you check out the rest of this YouTube channel to see those media theories in depth. We'll also be looking at particular case studies and examples of media theory and we'll try to apply some of the theories to examples of um, either scientific experiments or just anecdotal examples of media texts that have existed in society. So please continue to subscribe and watch some of these videos and I hope that this has been a helpful introduction to this unit.